in decision making under uncertainty, evidently we will need to take a uh, talk about decision analysis. So here I'll give an overview of decision analysis as a science. So it's both a prescriptive uh, science as a normative science. So it, it basically describes a set of actions uh, that are logical and that you can do in any decision making process. And also it's normative in the sense that we'll do some calculations uh, to quantify um, our actions and our decisions. So the number of really nice references, uh, Ron Howard um, is basically the, wrote the foundation of decision analysis. Uh, there is the handbook uh, of decision analysis, which is a really nice and accessible handbook uh, for a first time reader. Specifically to the earth sciences, there is the value of information handbook by Eidsvik and Mukherjee. And uh, specific to uh, the petroleum uh, industry, there's a really nice tutorial and introduction uh, making good decision by Bradfold and Beck. So decision is a science. Uh, and so we have to clarify some of that. So Ron Howard said that decision is a science because it consists of systematic procedure that transform these opaque decision problems into transparent decision problems by a sequence of transparent steps. So basically means that we are going to uh, state a number of rules that are based on logic, uh, mathematics, and probability, and that allow us, us to, to follow these steps uh, when making decisions. So it's maybe um, convenient or, in, or, or useful, or maybe not useful, but uh, sometimes we'd like to make decisions based on gut feeling or intuition. And so in decision science, we'll try to avoid that. And, um, and this is something we'll also discuss when we dis dis discuss Bayesianism. The problem, of course, in reality, and particularly to the Earth resources, is that we have to deal with many sources of uncertainty, that uh, their decisions are often not a single decision problem, but a, a complex series of decisions that need to be made, some on the long term, some on the short term. Uh, some that are very simple decisions in the field, some are more complex decisions related to, to planning. Often we have multiple ob uh, competing objectives, uh, and this is often uh, something related to risk and return. So for example, we can, uh, we can um, produce our um, earth resources, but at the same time uh, to ma maximize profit, but we have to be concerned about the environment, so we want to minimize environmental uh, impact. There's also, of course, a time component in decision making. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a short term time framework and a longer term time framework we have to consider. What's very important in decision science is that we start uh, by making some proper definitions and then we'll skip to the nomenclature and these definitions. So in decision science, we have what's called a scenario or an instantiation of every decision situation. For example, suppose that you're asked to flip a coin, call the flip of a coin. So you have basically a decision to make between uh, heads or tails, and then you may have, you will have a binary outcome, which is head or tail. So in essence, we have there in four scenarios. So a prospect is then how the decision maker views the future for each scenario. So uh, in that case, uh, we could say a quarter for each scenario it seems like a reasonable um, definition for a prospect. A lottery, also called a deal, uh, is a situation when you have uncertain prospect, but you don't have a say in a decision. For example, you could say uh, you are asked to, you are told essentially to call ahead, but you not have a say in this. And so that, in other words, then you face a lottery. So decision analysis is a science. That means it's both prescriptive and normative. Um, and there are a number of rules. And here are the, basically the five rules of decision analysis. We're not going to go over all these rules. Some of these you are very familiar with, such as the use of probability, um, etc. The only rule I'd like to uh, illustrate is the equivalence rule. And so um, to explain that, let's uh, instead of reading this particular text, Let's, um, let's explain that with a simple example. So imagine you're uh, doing groundwater management and you're drilling a consulting company and you'd like to advise whether in one area we need to drill many wells or few wells. So you'd like to make a profit, the more wells, the higher the profit. But of course, uh, drilling well has also a footprint and you don't want to drill too many wells uh, because also there may be not enough demand. So the uncertainty in this question is the future demand. So it could be high and low. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, you want your customers to be happy. That means uh, you don't want to have few wells in high demand. So what do you decide? Do you decide few or many? So in order to solve this problem with the equivalence rule, we have to essentially uh, state what is for you the best option and what is for you the worst option. So if you want to make a profit and have customers happy, then of course you want to build many wells with high profit. The worst situation is where you drill many wells, uh, you have uh, basically a very high cost, but uh, you have low demand. So uh, that's a problem for you because uh, in, the sense, in that sense, uh, you're not making much profit. So that's the worst situation for you. And then there are two situations that are in between those two situations. So um, there's few low, so there's, you know, you're not getting much, but customers are happy or a few high, um, you have well, some unhappy customers uh, and low income, but there's a small cost because you drill only a few wells. So what does this now then, uh, what do we then need to do um, in order to uh, solve that equivalence uh, rule practically? So the first thing is we have to identify all outcomes. That's what we just did and divide the best and the worst. Then we do a probability assessment and then comes the essentially the the part that's uh, the equivalence rule is that we're going to have to state some preference so we have these two other options remember the option two and three and we have to make an assessment of their preference based on how much we think they are the best and how much think they are the worst relative to the best and the worst that we have been stated the idea here essentially is that you want to get to a point where you only have best and only worst. You have basically a binary situation, a binary scenario. And therefore, by that doing that substitution, you can then calculate probabilities for those two deals, best and worst. And then you would simply pick the one with highest probability. So what does that mean here? So in order to do that, we have to organize our thoughts. And organize our thoughts, we'll use these kind of uh, decision trees. And so in these decision trees, uh, what we have is we making a decision. Uh, there's a decision to make uh, between many and few. And after making a decision, uh, we face an uncertainty, an uncertainty in demand, which could be high or low. So in other words, the, the decision tree is a logical organization of what will have happen in time. Uh, so that also means that any uncertainties before here are just ignored, or you cannot put an uncertainty in front of a decision if that's what you start out with. So uh, and that's a common mistake that's done with decision trees. So decision tree is a logical organization of what is going to happen in time. So first make a decision, then you face the uncertainty. So here we can then also logically organize uh, our outcomes of our best, the in-between outcomes and worst. So assume that we um, state some probability or believe on what the demand is going to be. So we say the demand uh, is high with probability P and therefore low with probability one minus P. So say uh, that we have a such statement of a belief and we say that we have probability that we have high demand is 40%. So this could be calculated from data or it could just be a subjective expression of belief. Okay, so this equivalence rule now works as follows. Remember that we had the issue that the scenario two and the scenario three, where we drill few wells, have low demand, and we drill few wells and very high demand. So now we have to say, how is that equivalent to best and worst? So in this is not necessarily, this is not a, something that's a subjective choice and is a personal uh, choice that we have. It's the equivalent uh, statement we make about this few low in terms of best and worst. So in few low, we don't care. We say it's neither best nor worst. So we could say it's 50% each. In a few and high, we, there we're a little more careful and we say, well, it's only 30% best and 70% and, and worst. So in that case, we're not uh, preferring this uh, much less in a sense than uh, few versus low. So once we have that, we can now organize things. Uh, that means we are adding a different, an additional branch uh, that has to do with the equivalence rule. Uh, so these probabilities were obtained from the previous uh, slide. So we have now few low had the equivalence of 30% best, 70% worst, and few low had an equivalence of 50% best and 50% worst. So now what we do is we solve this problem. In order to solve this problem, uh, we'd like to know uh, what is the 
what is the probability of what is the essentially the highest what will give you the the best choice is it many or few well that depends on what has the highest best and what is the lowest worst so uh, for example in this case we would solve that very simply by uh, calculating the best uh, essentially uh, multiplying 30 percent times 40 percent and 50 percent times 60 percent and for this branch that would be the best. So if I 30% times 40% plus 60% times 50%, if you add that up, that will come out to 42%. So we do the same for worst and we get then the final three, which is best and worst. And so we notice here that with many, we only get 40% out of the time best and with few, we get 42% of the time best. So the decision is to make few or to drill few. Okay, so that provides us some introduction to decision analysis and science, and we'll now further develop that. In order to develop that, and, be, and based on that rules, we introduce some more uh, nomenclature. So decisions are called conscious, irrevocable, so we can revoke it, allocation of resources. So it's basically investing money into an action or an alternative uh, that will uh, cost something and hopefully result into profit. And we would like to achieve some desired objective. So a decision is therefore a choice between mutually exclusive choices to be decided on. And so your decision, um, your decision analysis or your decision solution is only as good as the alternatives that you provide to the system. So this alternative will be judged according to certain objectives and that will have to do, for example, some objectives will be return objectives, we will maximize return, some will be risk objectives and will be minimize risk. And so in order to uh, score the alternatives uh, according to these, uh, these objectives, uh, we'll have attributes. So these are quantitative measures of how an alternative is achieved some objective. Eventually, that will be calculating into in terms of payoffs, which are outcomes of each alternative for, for each objective. So an attribute is the way we measure it, an outcome at a payoff is the actual outcome. Then we have uh, issues related to weighing, uh, weighing of objectives, uh, and there we'll introduce the value function uh, that allows the decision maker to express some degree of uh, how these uh, degree to which objectives are achieved. There's also the risk, risk preference. Uh, that means that the digital attitude towards uncertainty, and we'll uh, discuss averse, neutral, and risk seeking. And then there is also utility functions. Um, and we'll probably not cover that in this course. So in order to, to go over all these terms, uh, let's again look at a like, simple sort of virtual example. Suppose that there is a leakage of chemical in the subsurface. Um, so government analysts uh, in collaboration with consultants are speculating based on the geological nature of the subsurface, which is very heterogeneous, that this pollution may travel or may not have traveled to the aquifer system and therefore get potentially widely distributed. So you have a decision to make between two alternatives. First is to act, the second alternative is not act and do nothing. So if you act, you would start a cleaning uh, operation, which is costly. If you don't act, then there's no cost, but there's a potential damage to be paid because of contamination and there's an environmental risk. So what decision would you make um, and how would you reach that decision? And potentially also, would you start in saying, well, maybe we need to invest in monitoring and maybe that provides an idea of uh, an informed idea of whether we should act or not act. So the first thing that we have to, we have now stated the alternatives. In fact, later on, we'll have four alternatives. It will be cleanup, do not clean up, partial cleanup, and detailed cleanup. In order then to uh, evaluate those various alternatives, we have to state objectives. And so uh, objectives will um, be stated through a value tree. So an objective is basically starts always with a verb. It says maximize this or minimize that. And it's very important to do that. So for example, we could say uh, welfare is not an objective, improving welfare is an objective. Uh, population health is not an objective, maximizing population health is an objective. So it's important to also state the maximize and minimize. So there are certain objectives uh, that are what are called fundamental objectives and there are certain objectives called means objectives. So, for example, the objectives that are higher up in this tree are fundamental objectives. So, 
uh, if if you say, well, why do we have this fundamental objective, maximize satisfaction of local population? Then the, just the reason is because that's what I what my morality tell, tells me or what I feel it should be. The means objective is therefore an objective that allows you to achieve this fundamental objective. For example, you could say, I'd like to maximize satisfaction of local population uh, by maximizing population safety and minimizing crime or other uh, things. So each objective will have attributes and will get then weights that are associated with each uh, attributes. And we'll talk about these two issues. So eventually we would like to come to a matrix like this. It's a matrix where for each, uh, we have a number of alternatives. So remember we said that we have detailed cleanup, cleanup, partial cleanup, and do not cleanup. And we'd like to see how each of those actions score against the objective that we stated. So in our case, uh, our our pollution uh, cleanup will cost money, uh, but also our pollution, if pollution occurs and we do not clean up, that also costs money uh, because of some penalty. And so therefore the government may need, may need to increase taxes. So we would like to minimize tax collection. Uh, at the same time, we want to minimize industrial pollution. So now this is no longer a dollar value, but this could be some kind of PPM, uh, parts per million. Uh, we'd like to protect the ecosystem and in that case we have more of a sort of a vague scale uh, instead of an actual nominal scale we just say it's from one to five where one means there's no protection of course when you do not clean up there's no protection when you clean up detail there's a high protection same for population health there also may be due to clean up economic interruptions may have to close down some streets and that will lead to economic interaction when you minimize that so now you wonder where all these numbers come from. Uh, and some of these numbers come from modeling. Uh, some of these numbers come from the kind of studies we'll do later in the course, that is to use data, build models on the subsurface, and actually simulate the action of cleanup uh, and predict essentially what uh, the MPV of such action could be. But of course, that, that will be subject to uncertainty because we do not know exactly the subsurface. So these numbers are actually coming from probability distributions. And that's something I'll explain in the next slide. So imagine that you have done some modeling and you come up with various probability distributions. Uh, again, that's something that's uh, going to be the, the issue in the rest of the course is to quantify uncertainty on, uh, on the distribution here of dollar values, uh, let's say, uh, given uh, the kind of action uh, that we do. So the, the X axis is your dollar values. So if you are then a risk neutral person, you will bet on the expected value. Another means that you take this distribution, calculate the expected value and find then uh, what value that we have. So here, for example, we see that with a partial cleanup, uh, we get an expected value, say eight, 10, 12, and then 18. And that was in the previous table, that's what we got. If you, however, a risk averse person, you bet on something that's larger. You bet on the fact that you may actually get a large uh, mm -hmm. value uh, in your in your dollars uh, that you have to pay more taxes than expected than the expected value, and then you get this green thing here. So, for example, for the partial, we bet on the green, and we find now that partial is not as favorable as cleanup when uh, we are risk averse, and that's in terms of uh, the minimizing of tax uh, collection. Okay, so now we have a table and the problem in that table uh, is that we have several uh, different values. Some are from one to five, other are from, um, from, from zero to 365 days, etc. So we have to uh, now turn these into a common scale. And, and, and by doing and by doing this and, and turning this into a common scale, it allows us also to add preference to which objective is more important to you and what happens within that objective. For example, if you, we're going to turn this money scale into a scale of zero to 100 and the same for all of the other scales. And in this particular case, for example, if I use this function that's not linear, but nonlinear, then what it essentially means is that if we have a tax collection of nine and we would increase that to 15, then on the scale on this y-axis, it would only increase from 20 to 25. So that means that we do not find this increase very important, and so we, we have not much preference there. So while if, if you have a small change, uh, again, or in a small change, then you also have uh, a similar issue. Uh, 
So that's different, for example, than for a linear function or for, a, for, for another function. And so this allows us to uh, essentially uh, uh, allows us to give the preference uh, for each of these uh, different objectives. So previously we talked about uh, a way of weighing that had to do with preference. So with preference expressed by these value functions that turn our particular attribute into uh, some kind of common score. So the second uh, time of uh, weighing has to do with the fact that some uh, objectives are better at discriminating the alternatives than others. So you can imagine that um, if I look here, for example, at tax collection, I would have tax collection being equal amongst all these alternatives, even though you find tax collection very important, it's your preference, uh, it will not affect the decision because it does not discriminate amongst the alternatives. So swing weighing is a way of accounting for that. And in swing weighing, um, we will, uh, looking again at sort of a best worst case scenario, remember that we did that uh, in the beginning when we talked about uh, the preference probability or the equivalence probability, sorry. So again, we are going to look at the best case and the worst case for each. And then what we do is we rank them based on some kind of relative uh, difference, of course, because again, every unit is, is, is different here. So uh, what we see here, for example, of course, is that uh, 500 days uh, versus zero days uh, ends up being uh, the most discriminating, so it gets the weight one, while uh, tax collection gets the weight five. Okay, so now we are uh, objectives, That's, as I mentioned, objectives should be weighed relative to how well they discriminate the alternatives. Okay, so now we can uh, pull everything together. Um, so we have our swing weights, we take a uh, swing ranks. So we take those swing ranks, turn them in swing weights. It's simply uh, take the sum of all the ranks and divide by, uh, take the sum of all the ranks and then take each rank and divide by that sum. And so we get these weights here. So these are now the values uh, that are turned into uh, the common scale. And so what we'll just do now is take a weighted average. So 0 0.07 times 30, 0 0.27 times 100, etc. ends up being 62. And then we find all the other ones. So now uh, this is, of course, in a risk neutral person. Uh, we're looking at averages. And so uh, the best case here would be to clean up. And the second best would be to do a detailed cleanup. So you could say, yeah, that's all great, but um, are there possible um, things I could trade off? Because you could see that, um, for example, the, uh, the detailed cleanup is pretty close to the cleanup, and the detailed cleanup has some. Uh, some really interesting features as well. It um, um, that versus the cleanup, it, it had scores better on some uh, occasions and not as good as on other occasions. So what we can do here is to group things, and we are going to group things in terms of risk versus return, because in our objectives we have some objectives that are return objectives. So minimize tax collection, that's good. That's return. Minimize economic interruption, that's good. That's um, that's a return. But then you have, for example, industrial pollution, that's a risk. So, uh, so that's something that goes in the risk part as well as ecosystem protection and population health. So if we now sum or average out each of these individual green uh, and the red here, then we find, so we'll take 0 0.07 times 30, that's 2.1. And then I have uh, 0 0.33 times 0. If I add that up, I can, I, of course, come down to 2.1, etc. So now what we'll do is we'll plot this risk versus return. And we do that in a very special fashion. Uh, that's in the next slide here. So the next slide, we have something that's on the risk scale. So something scores well on the risk scale has a high score. And something that scores poor on the risk scale has a low score. So this also means that the risk scale has to be uh, read off in the reverse. So we go down more risk, more return. And so now we've noticed that um, there are some alternatives that I will never do, uh, simply because they have a more risk and less return. For example, do not clean up as more risk and less return than uh, partial cleanup. But then there's other ones where we can trade off. So we could say, I'd like to uh, take, for example, detailed cleanup, which has a very low risk, but very minimal return. If I drop risk just a little bit, then I get cleanup. So that's a that's a way of that, that making that trade off. Or I could say, I'll take cleanup and uh, I'll drop, uh, I am I'm willing to be much more risky and also I'm getting much more return. 
And of course, that's very common is that mostly when you have high risk uh, alternatives, you also have high return alternatives. Okay, so what we've done so far a lot is using expected value for comparing alternatives. And so in this expected value, uh, the idea is that we're playing this game in the long run, because of course an expectation is something that I expect to occur many times over many decision questions that you have. There are certain decision questions, however, that don't fall under this, um, this category. For example, the design of a nuclear waste repository. Uh, we're not playing the game in the long run uh, because we'd like to, this thing to be very safe and this is one, one chance game. We, or design of a nuclear uh, facility of course, we don't want this uh, nuclear facility to blow up. That's uh, the expected value there is sort of meaningless. It also means that some alternatives are more risky than others. And so the risk uh, profile is essentially, excuse me, is uh, essentially plotting uh, the, the possible alternatives that could happen and their associated probability. And in previous case, we just calculated an average based on that. So let's do an example. Let's say we have this hypothetical decision tree uh, where uh, we make uh, a decision between two alternatives. Uh, and then if you take this alternative, uh, we face an uncertainty and we get a certain payoff. So for example, with, high, with low probability, we get a high payoff and with uh, high probability, we get a low payoff. Then there's this alternative one uh, where you don't face uh, possibly the same uh, or a different uncertainty. And then you have two branches. In case this happened, you make this decision. In case that happens, you, you are going to make this decision and so on and so on. So remember a decision tree is nothing more than a, a logical organization of how events will play out in time. And so the idea of solving the decision tree is then to take the optimal branches. We saw that that's basically done by the reverse calculation by expected values. So if we do that for this particular case, because we have all the probabilities, we have all the, uh, the various alternatives listed, then we find that the best option is A1. After that, uh, the best option, if, if this would be now the decision, uh, this would be the particular event happening, the best option is A5. This one, the best option is A6. What that means essentially is that all these options that were previously here at those branches, they're all now gone. We'll never see those options or those outcomes or payoffs. So same here, um, oh, sorry, I should put my pointer up. Uh, we'll see here that uh, all these options here, there are these payoffs, they are gone. We'll never see those because we take A5. Same here, uh, these options are gone, uh, we'll never uh, do A2, et cetera. So now we notice that uh, the possibilities that are existing are simply 400, 200, 1000, minus 100, and 300. And so for example, uh, if you look at 200, that happens with a probability uh, that is equal to 0 0.4 times 0 0.t, and then there's nothing left of that 0.08, et cetera. So previously, what we would have done is just calculate an average of this. So take that times that, that times that, et cetera, uh, add that all up, and we'll get an expected value. In the risk profile, we just keep those things. We just say, uh, let's plot the um, essentially the risk or the probability uh, of an event happening in one of the alternatives. And remember, that was minus 300, minus 100, 200, 400,000. And what you notice now is that although the average here, I think, is around uh, 180, we notice that there are a number of very risky alternatives that have very high probability. So there's actually a pretty high chance, namely 40% of getting minus 100 and 50% uh, getting minus 300. So this is actually almost a 50-50% chance uh, that you will have actually no return on this project. So there's, of course, still a high chance of having a 1,000, but you have to weigh out against these other alternatives. Okay, that brings us to the final part uh, of this decision science, uh, value of information. I'll just give you a brief uh, introduction and ideas of the main elements of value of information. There will be lectures later on that look at actual value of information problem in earth sciences and in earth resources uh, forecasting. And so uh, we'll be treating those in more detail later. So a value of information question starts by providing yourself with an additional alternative. So you, you don't just say, I'm going to go ahead and here are the possible options that can happen. You just give yourself an additional alternative. So instead of saying, I'm going to do detail cleanup, detail cleanup, cleanup, partial cleanup, you say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm just calculating, I'm gathering first information 
because uh, my risk profile, I don't like it that much. Uh, I'd like to narrow uncertainties better. I'd like to get a better understanding of what I'm facing. So the, the point here is that we're not going to collect the information. We're going to assess a priori before collecting the information uh, what that value is. And so this is different from, I mentioned this before, this is different from the data worth problem where you just like to understand how data can reveal uh, something about an interesting subsurface property such as hydraulic connectivity. It depends actually on the decision context. Uh, it does depend on the data worth, the little bit of information, but it also depends on what you know uh, a priori. So value of information uh, does not depend on cost of information. Cost of information is a sunk cost, and so is ignored. And so uh, what we need to do is to compare the value of information with the cost of information, which uh, then allows us to uh, judge whether or not we should collect the information, yes or no. So value of information is a decision-related uh, problem. So here we have a simple decision problem where we have a base project and we could say there are two possibilities. Either I take D2, which says walk away, or I do D1, and so I get nothing. I do D1 and then I face uncertainty and I get an MPV. It could be a positive NPV, negative MPV. And so the question is, what would I do? And imagine that currently, this D1 is the best branch, uh, but you're not happy about these uh, uncertainties uh, that are associated with these MPVs. You'd like to collect more information. So the question is, uh, you'd like to collect more information that narrows the uncertainty on A1. So I'd like to change this uh, probability. And for example, you'd like this to be higher or lower. You don't want to say it to be 50-50. You'd like to have something that is a bit more uncertain. So as I mentioned before, uh, value of information is just like a lot of decision science is uh, relies on some prescriptive way of calculating things. So it's very important to follow these rules. If you don't follow these rules, what you often get is negative value of information, which can happen. So value of information is seen as an additional alternative. So instead of doing D1, D2, you give yourself an additional branch. You say DA, which means I collect information. So, we, of course, we don't know what that information uh, will collect. It'd be indicative of something. For example, it may indicate uh, that there is connectivity in the subsurface, or it may indicate there's a lack of connectivity in the subsurface, or it may indicate any kind of things. And so that indication depends, of course, on the relationship between what you're trying to uh, assess, the uncertainties of the A1, A2, and what kind of information it is that you're collecting. So, if you decide to collect information, again, remember a decision tree is something that's a logical organization of time. Then you don't know what information you'll get, uh, but you, you could say in the simplest fashion, it may indicate something good or it may indicate something bad. So we don't know that yet. So we just, we just opt ourselves into these two positions. So once it indicates something good, then uh, you have to simply repeat your base project. So then you're going to either decide to go do something or decide to uh, just walk away. So what you notice here is that this part here is repeated exactly over here. And that's very important uh, that we do that. Otherwise, we'll get negative value of information. The other thing that's really important is to, understand, is to essentially estimate these probabilities. Uh, and so these are our reali what's called reliability probabilities. It tells us if I collect information, how much that tell me now about this unknown? And so this is now a conditional distribution while a priori, uh, we had just a prior distribution. So what you hope of course, is that these prediction uh, probabilities are altered. And then by altering these probabilities, when we solve the decision tree, we'll find that indeed collecting information is more important. And with that will come also a particular decision uh, of, of whether you decide to do D1 or D2 later on. Okay, so that's a, a good overview, I believe, to of our introduction, at least, to uh, decision science. Uh, so this is all nice, uh, simple examples, but of course, in reality, when you go to real companies, and particularly in Earth Resources, this becomes a serious challenge. We have there, uh, in Earth Resources, many stakeholders. We have stockholders, we have the board, we have uh, domain experts, we have uh, local people that near live near the resources, etc. So uh, in these many stakeholders, they have, may have very different uh, objectives and conflict and objectives. And so, or, and so formulating this objective properly and, and, or in defining the decision context and who the decision maker is, uh, is going to be very important. These are kind of more soft skills that we did not talk much about. 
The second thing is that we're dealing with earth sciences, so we're dealing with physics and chemistry, biology, engineering, data science, computer science. So there are many, many domain experts involved, and there's a technical complexity. And so the problem often is that these domain experts uh, are going to dominate the decision problem, and thereby that may lead to some kind of decision paralysis that domain experts say, well, we need to do more work, we need to model longer, we need to collect more data, we don't know. Uh, and so maybe that, that knowledge that needs to be gained is not relevant to the decision problem or to the other stakeholders. And so there is this issue that we have to deal with there. Um, cognitive bias, particularly for the domain experts, and we talked a lot about that, the, uh, the problem of essentially um, ignoring base rates. Uh, anchoring means uh, trying to get an answer and then uh, everything is anchored around that single answer and we do sort of a plus minus. Uh, kind of a study, and so that's something that we'll try to avoid when we do Monte Carlo in the, later on in the course. Also mentioned confirmation biases. Uh, I haven't mentioned confirmation biases. It's essentially where we try to get information to confirm what we already know. And so uh, this is a little bit of that um, we've seen with um, with the Tversky and Kahneman uh, studies, is that this is uh, essentially happening very frequently uh, because of the representativeness uh, by which people are making uh, evaluations and look at evidence.